morning. Can I hear a hallelujah? Hallelujah! You know why? Because we survived snow again. <laughs> and you know, in the past, usually what they predict, at least in past years, we don't get anywhere near of the snowfall they predict. This time around, we, at least here in Flint, we really got it. Uh, somebody who lives outside of this area shared with me snowfall totals, and uh, Flint was the record center uh, for the southern part of Michigan, 11 inches. And I've heard others who have went out and measured in the yard and said actually their measurement is a little bit more. But thank you to all of the gentlemen, to JR and to Kurt and to John Berger and others who came to, uh, after the snowfall twice and cleared the lot and plowed the driveway and took care of the walkway. Thank you guys and God bless you for your hard work. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us all safe, especially those that had to travel out any time during that snowfall. And here we are all safe and together because the Lord truly does watch over us and care for us. So we resume this week. Uh, we canceled Bible studies, at least in-person Bible studies, last week because of the snow. They're back. We plan on meeting actually in person in the fellowship hall Monday afternoon, Wednesday morning, Wednesday evening. We will continue to Zoom those for people especially you or if you're shipping at home. Hello, welcome, glad you joined us. Uh, they'll be available on Zoom just as they have been. One meeting had to be rescheduled, uh, actually it's a combination. The Education and Stewardship Committee meeting from last week will be rescheduled, it'll happen on Monday at 11 o'clock. So Education and Stewardship, both of those committees meet Monday at 11 o'clock. <clears throat> and our monthly Stewards by God's Design Task Force meeting will be this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. <coughs> Excuse me, all of those are in your uh, news and notes. Check that out. Next Sunday. What's next Sunday? What? Super Bowl. Super Bowl. And not to, uh, you know, lean my allegiance any way, in any particular way, LA Rams, <laughs> or uh, any particular quarterback, Matt Stafford. <laughs> Sunday is the Super Bowl. Starts at six thirty, but there's something else happening on Sunday, and that is Valentine's a dinner. Valentine's dinner, yes. <laughs> We've shortened it. Uh, that information is in your news and notes. We did have till five. I don't think anybody, because you're all going to want to go home and root for Matt and the LA Rams, right? So we want to get you out of here in a timely fashion. It'll happen right after worship on next Sunday, Valentine's Day uh, dinner and Bible study, and we'll wind it up around 3. Of course, you can leave any time, and you can get home and get all your supplies and stuff ready for them. <laughs> Fellowship hour. Silent. Thank you. Several of you answered the call, and we have people scheduled to uh, take care of Fellowship Hour this week. God bless you. If you have not, there's still open dates. It's a great way for you to just do a really simple thing, which is being part of the church, and that's being involved in the ministry here. It encourages us to sit and share faith and fellowship, which is very important. That doesn't happen in the outside world. We drive in our own little cars, and we don't want to wave at anybody because we might wave with a particular finger and upset them. <laughs> We need this interaction. There used to be a day when people would sit on their front porch and wave and talk to people that goes by. We don't do that anymore. But this is where we can actually connect with people who are like-minded and share the same spirit, share our problems, share our joys, and share our faith. So thank you to those who signed up, and I encourage people to continue. Check your news and notes in the fellowship, uh, uh, the bulletin board in the fellowship hall for all kinds of stuff that's coming up. We have a lot of stuff coming up. Finally, uh, we're going to be praying for several members this week. Uh, one is Ron Jonas, who's not here. He, po he has possible bronchitis, and he went and had a chest x-ray, and we're waiting for the results. Uh, Karen told me that he received an inhaler, and that seems to be helping. He's not coughing as bad, but we will pray for him. Bill Carpenter and his daughter, Mary Ann, who are in Florida, they've contracted COVID down there. Bill has not been doing too well, but the last report I heard, he was better. She's trying to keep him out of the hospital. She also has COVID, but not as bad as he does. So we'll be praying for both of them. And then Irvin Bland's mother, Jackie, is recovering from a fall. She had to have surgery to repair her hip. She's in Genesis. I was able to visit her, and she's fine. 
you know how Earth's mom is, right? She always wants to be busy doing stuff. Well, she wanted to get up and go help with the dishes at Genesis, so <laughs> she's doing fine. I told them to give her a mop or a, a vacuum cleaner and she'd take care of the floor for them. Those are the announcements for today. With that, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Take a moment from where you're sitting, extend your hand, and share that peace of Christ with a wave and a smile with your fellow worshipers. Take a moment also and wave at the camera as we greet those people in the name of the Lord who are worshiping from home. Let's begin our worship with our opening hymn, Holy, Holy. Beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth? I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave me and forgive my sin. We pause for a moment of silent reflection on God's word and for self examination. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, to which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy innocent bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in this stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We responsibly read Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple, and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things, your name and your word. On the day I called, 
you answered me. My strength of soul you increase. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. But the body he knows from the heart. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation, may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is Isaiah chapter 6. It's the appointed Old Testament reading. It'll be from this reading that the sermon will be drawn this morning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until the cities lie in waste without inhabitant, and the house without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like the terebinth or the oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. This is the word of the Lord. Our appointed epistle lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, as we continue to read through that book here in Epiphany. 
This is Paul continuing to talk about spiritual gifts, and he's especially zooming in on this idea of speaking in tongues, which, by the way, over and over again in the New Testament, when that word is translated, it's always languages, not as our Pentecostal brothers would say, some spiritual words that only the angels know. There were people at that time that had the gift of being able to interpret and speak languages they had not known before, but that has, it has its place in ministry. And Paul continues to put that underneath the proclamation, the clear proclamation of the gospel. Paul writes, Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, try to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying. For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would invite you to stand as you are. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of those boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that both began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, be seated. And I would invite those young adults and children to come up front for a message just for them. Hi! That's awesome, isn't it? I love to hear that. Why don't you have a seat right here, guys, so I can see you. Right here, little Nora Nora Nora. We have Nora Nora visiting with us today. It's pretty cool. All right, we've been thinking about our gospel lesson, girls. You ever go ice fishing? No? No? I did once or twice, and uh, I really enjoy it a lot. I mean, think about it. It's cold outside, right? And you're sitting there, and you got a hole drilled in the ice, and you got your line in, and... You're just there. When you go fishing in the summer, what do you get to do? <laughs> cast it out. Reel it back in. Cast it out. Reel it back in. At least you're doing something, right? 
Here you're just. Yes. You just set it down. Well, you're boring. <laughs> Did you catch anything? Sure. All right. When I went ice fishing, I caught nothing. And one of the reasons I haven't gone yet. And I also have a fear that when I'm walking out on the ice, what if I'm to hit one of those soft spots? So I don't like to go out on the ice. I don't really think it's safe. What would it be like to go ice fishing with Jesus? It would be safe. What else? When the disciples went fishing with Jesus, how many did they catch? More than they ever had in their life. Peter, that's his job. That's his profession. He's a fisherman. That's how he makes his living. He catches fish and he eats them and he sells them to people in the town. He had never seen the size of the catch that he had experienced with Jesus. The net was stretching. Two boats had to be there to haul it in. And even then, the boats are sinking. So why did Jesus do that? Was he just showing him that he's a superior fisherman, that he knows more than Peter does about fishing? <laughs> he does know more than, he, than Peter does. Because who is he? Peter's looking at him as just this carpenter dude from Nazareth. Before they go out, you get that from Peter. This is not the time to fish, Jesus. We fished all night, we caught nothing. Which, by the way, that's when you fish is at night, okay? Just so you know, Jesus. We didn't catch anything at night. And you don't catch them out in the deep because the nets can't go down that deep. But if you say, sure, we'll go out, fine. Peter didn't understand that Jesus isn't just a man who was a carpenter. He was God. He's God who's in charge of all creation. He knows where the fish is. He can move those fish to come into the nets. More fish than Peter ever caught. And that was his purpose. He wanted to show Peter and the disciples that, yeah, he's a man, but he's more than a man. And how does Peter react to this? What does he do before Jesus? He bows down and he said, I'm a sinful man. Depart from me. I can't even be in your presence. Because Peter knows in some way, shape, or form, this is more than a man that stands before him in some way that he can't understand. And even today, with all of Scripture, we don't completely understand He's God. God is really present there in this man. And when God is present, as we learned from our Old Testament lesson, we can do nothing but say, we're poor, miserable sinners. But Jesus, Jesus tells Peter, don't be afraid. Why? Peter, your sins are forgiven. What's not communicated but is there is the words that were said to Isaiah. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is covered, it's removed, it's forgiven. Follow me. You had that said in your baptism. And he sends us out just like Peter. Not to change people's hearts and minds through our great words, but to cast the net, to cast our faith. To one-on-one -on -one say to people, you struggling in life? I have an answer for you. He can do anything. He can make a miraculous catch of fish, and he can change your life, and his name is Jesus. That's what we do as the church. Cast the net of the gospel. And when we fail, your guilt is taken away, your sin is atoned for. Christ did that for you on the cross, as well as for all the people. Let's thank him and pray him, and you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you. Words of forgiveness. For the faith we have in our heart to hold fast to the gospel and the power of your spirit in those words to forgive others. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Nora, thank you for coming up and being such a good girl. All right. Papa's going to continue to talk, though, okay? Okay. She always asks that. One Sunday she was asking Susan, is Papa done talking yet?
I'm done for now, and I'll be talking again. You guys can go back to your uh, parents. Chrissy, you guys could go with Miss Chrissy if you want to. It's a children's church. <laughs> we continue on with our sermon. sermon this morning does come from Isaiah 6, and we're going to kind of go through verses 1 to 12, but the focus for me originally was verses 8 to 12. I call it a call to ministry. It's kind of an evangelism sermon, which is always hard. It's hard for me, and it's probably hard for you. Evangelism, sharing our faith, is not something we're all very comfortable with, is it? I know a few individuals that have what you would call the spiritual gift of evangelism. I don't necessarily have it. I have gifts where I can get up in front of you and proclaim God's word in this setting. But one-on-one, it's a struggle. I know it is for you. Perhaps you've struggled with it before when you're sitting down and talking to people. Maybe it's somebody, a member of your family, that you really wish would have the same faith that you do. And you sit down and you have an opportunity and the door is open and you're bearing your heart to this person. You know that they could really use the faith that you have. You so much want them to understand the difference that Jesus makes in your life, how you trust in his death and resurrection. And as you're looking at them, you can tell it's falling on deaf ears. And their response is anything from passive like, yeah, sure, yeah. Great, sounds great. The animosity where they get up and leave, or they tell you, quit preaching, or just stop already, okay? 
those kind of reactions make it hard for us to be willing to share the gospel. They kind of turn us off. Happens to me, too. The reaction I see when I'm up here preaching, not just in this setting, but I'm especially thinking about where I was yesterday. I was at a funeral. I was called by Schwartz Funeral Home to do a funeral for somebody I didn't know. But they led me to believe that this man had some kind of ties with a Lutheran. The family wanted a Lutheran minister, a real Lutheran minister. I know they got me, right? They wanted somebody who had a master of divinity. They didn't know that what it was, but somebody that was theologically trained and serving as a pastor somewhere. This man, I was told, wasn't really a religious person. Meaning to me, he didn't have a relationship with the Lord. And here I am to do a funeral for him, and here I am having to preach a message to him and to mo many other people who more than other settings, you're surrounded by people that don't have faith. It is an evangelism opportunity, which is why it was open on my schedule and I took it. So I'm there preaching, and I really want to express the love and the faith I have in Jesus Christ and what it can mean to them. Because in, in, in that, those people that were there were a lot of AA members. These were people that had struggled. These were people who were praying that serenity prayer but didn't know who to pray it to. Were just talking to nobody because they didn't know about God, the triune God, and they didn't have faith in Jesus. And so I'm doing all I can to explain to undoctrinated ears what our faith is. And as I'm doing that, and I'm actually at a point where I, I use Revelation 21 where it talks about what will happen to people who die out of the faith. You go to the eternal lake of fire, suffering, and death. And I'd been building up to this point. And I look, and there's two girls right back there, and they're laughing at each other. And they're giggling. I'm thinking, you guys really need to get this. Because if you die outside of faith and Christ returns, you're not going to be giggling. It happens when you proclaim the gospel. Eyes roll back in the heads. It never fails at that point. Perhaps somebody will get up and walk out of the sanctuary and all eyes turn to them. Wow, look, somebody's walking out of the sanctuary. And they continue to follow him all the way out. And I wonder if the words of gospel that I'm proclaiming are falling on deaf ears. And it's frustrating. I wonder what difference would it make if Christ himself were to appear right here in all his glory, would they pay attention then? That's kind of what we have happening in our Old Testament lesson. Isaiah is confronted with a manifestation of the Lord God himself. His account starts off within the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This particular detail, the year that King Uzziah died, gives us a stamp on when this happened. But it's more than that. Isaiah is including this because this is a point in the history of the southern kingdom of Judea and Jerusalem where the tide is turning, where the fortunes of the people are taking a turn for the worse. Uzziah was started off to be a great king. He was faithful, he believed in the Lord, and he followed the Lord's precepts and commands and led the people to. But towards the end, he became unfaithful, he became arrogant. As a matter of fact, he went into the temple and decided that he had the right to offer incense before the altar, something that only the priests were allowed to do. And as a result of that, he was stricken with some skin disease. doesn't say what it was. could have been leprosy. It could have been something else. But it forced him to give up his throne and his rule and be quarantined and locked away, never again to enter the temple, even to worship, never again to rule until the day that he died. The fortunes of Judea, the southern kingdom, and Jerusalem had been booming. 
They extended their borders almost to the point to where David and Solomon had them. The economy was going gangbusters. But not only the king became arrogant, but the people. And Isaiah is called to warn them of what will come if they remain that way. And he's called by this wondrous vision. The Lord high up on a throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Notice in this description, there's no description of the person that's on the throne. The face, all we have is the robe stretching down and the hem. The bottom hem of that robe fills the holy place. This is a magnificent vision. And this manifestation of the Lord only goes up from there. And you kind of have to understand how Jewish theology goes. The temple itself was an earthly representation of the throne room of God, where God himself reigned and ruled. This vision starts here on earth and extends up to where God himself is ruling. It's not so much a manifestation of the person of God, not like what John the Apostle will see in Revelation where he sees Jesus Christ himself. That is God the Son. But the manifestation here is the holiness of God. That's what's being impressed upon Isaiah and upon us too. Above him stood the seraphim. Comes from a Jewish word, a Hebrew word, seraphim, which is, kind of describes a fiery creature. These aren't your cherubs. These aren't cute little babies. These are, if you would see them, scary individuals. They're huge, they're mighty, and they look like they're on fire. Six wings. And what are they doing with those wings? Covering their feet and their face. These are holy creatures. God created them holy so they can stand in his presence. But even these holy creatures don't see fit to stand in the presence of the holiness of God without covering themselves because they realize they're not worthy. How much more sinful man when he stands in the presence of the holiness of God. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. What are they doing? They're doing what we did when we started this worship service. They're worshiping God. They're exclaiming his holiness, his otherness, his sinfulness, his being different than anything else in creation, above creation. We did it to begin our service. We'll do it as part of our communion service where we find ourselves in the presence of God himself cloaked in the sacrament. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. How does Isaiah respond? Kind of the same way you responded when we started our worship service. Why do we have confession at the beginning of the service? Because we believe in the divine service you enter in and are in the presence of God himself. He's cloaked. He's cloaked and covered in the word and in the sacrament. But he's there. You look in the Bible in any other time when a person is confronted by the real presence of the Lord in any way, shape, or form, the first thing out of their mouth is, woe is me, I'm a sinner. Because that's what God's holiness shows us, how we are not holy, how we are unholy. Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, a vision that no sinful man wants to see. You get the picture of what Isaiah thinks will happen? He doesn't think he's going to survive this. Perhaps he's thinking back about King Uzziah, what happened when he appeared in the holy place of the temple and, do, and did something that he shouldn't do. He suffered and died. Perhaps Isaiah is wondering if the same might happen to him. One of these seraphim flew to him. I wonder how much that scared Isaiah at first. 
In his hand is a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. This is the altar that is in the holy place. It's where they burned incense, and that incense set the prayers of the people symbolically up to the Lord. What has Isaiah been saying with, Woe is me, for I am a sinful man of unclean lips and a people of unclean lips? That's a prayer. That's a prayer of desperate confession. And this seraphim coming with the burning coal from the altars, God answering that prayer. He touches Isaiah's mouth and says, Behold, this has touched your lips. Isaiah, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. For a man that thought he was going to die, what great words of grace, mercy, and love are coming. Yes, Isaiah, you are a man of unclean lips. And it's not just your lips. As Jesus would go to teach, what pours out of our lips is the sin that's in our heart. And Isaiah, you've got that sin. And the people you live in, they've got that sin. But you, Isaiah, your guilt is gone and your sin is atoned for. Not because God is just saying, you know what, it doesn't matter, that's okay. I'll forget about what you've said and what you've done. No, he can't. He's holy. A holy God is a God of justice. Sin must be punished. And the wages of sin, as Paul said, is death. Eternal death. Eternal separation from God. But that's not what he has in mind for Isaiah. So how can Isaiah receive such a wonderful gift? Well, Isaiah didn't earn it. But there is one that did. He's looking forward to the coming of God the Son himself. That same one that's manifesting himself on the throne would take on human form and come down and enter creation for the very purpose of being able to pass that message along to all mankind. He took their sin upon himself so they would never suffer it. Somebody had to die, and God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, said, Here I am. Send me to the cross. Send me with all those people's sin. Send me to suffer and die for them, for you, for me. Even for those ladies at the funeral that weren't listening, for all of us. That's his message to you today. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Not because of anything you've done or ever could do, but because of everything that God the Son has done for you. What an amazing message. What an amazing faith that we have. A faith that changes hearts and minds. The next thing that happens is Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? As a side note, see, there's two different kind of pronouns. Whom shall I send? Because our Lord God is one. Who will go for us? Because he manifests himself as the triune God. Who will go for us? Here's Isaiah that pops up before he even knows what all of this call is going to be. Here I am, send me. How could that happen? Because... When that message of grace and forgiveness comes, when it comes into your heart and your life that your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for, it changes you. It's changed me. And encourages us to do and to pass that message along to those around us. And that's the mission that Isaiah is given. God describes what it's going to be like. Go. Say to these people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. After this wonder gospel message, this is a hard message to hear. It sounds like Isaiah is purposely being sent out to shut the ears and eyes of these people so they won't be saved. But here's the key. Go and say to this people, not to my people, but to this people. Why? Because those people refuse to be his people. 
They've turned away from him in faith. They're no longer trusting in him. They're trusting in other gods. They're trusting in themselves. And this is the sad fact of when we go and proclaim law and gospel. People are going to turn away and they're not going to listen because their hearts are already hardened, their ears are already shut. It happened then and it happens in the world out there today. We're sent to proclaim exactly who they are, that by following their heart's desires, they are turning away from God. By ignoring his will and his description of what life is, what marriage is, the fact that we were born one sex and should remain one sex, all that the world doesn't want to hear. They stop their ears and they get mad and they blame us, the church. And it's not our message, it's God's message. But it offends them. Their hearts are hard. And when we proclaim that message, many times hearts get harder and ears stop up more. And even when you proclaim the gospel, they don't want to hear it. They laugh, they turn away, they walk out the door, they ignore you. That's what Isaiah faced. He loved these people. He wanted them to hear and understand, and I'm sure some did. But the majority ignored his warning. They thought because they had the temple there in Jerusalem, nothing would ever happen because the Lord is there. Well, the Lord doesn't hang around forever with people with unclean lips and unclean hearts. Isaiah asked him, how long do I do this, Lord? How long should this message be out there until the cities lie and waste without inhabitant and the houses without people and the land is desolate and the Lord removes people far away? and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. God is saying this message is going to be proclaimed up until the day Babylon comes and that beautiful temple that they're trusting in is destroyed and the people are taken away. Some killed, others are taken into exile in Babylon and your beautiful land is totally destroyed first by Assyria and then by Babylon. The paradise that I gave you is gone because you turned away from me and refused to turn back. This is a foreshadowing of a day that's yet to come. It's the last day. On the last day, everything, everything that exists on this earth will be gone. Your houses, your cars, gone. Reality is you know it will end. There'll be Jesus returning in all of his glory, a sight beyond what Isaiah, call, Isaiah saw. And there'll be you and I. And those that have refused to believe the message that we've proclaimed from this day, refused to believe their entire life, will be exiled from the Lord's presence forever in the eternal lake of fire, where not only is God not, but where they'll suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually forever. the reason why we as the church have a message to proclaim. And the message is the same thing that will assure that we will not face that. The message from the cross. The message of Christ to each one of you who believes. Behold, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. You're forgiven. You won't suffer that eternal faith because Christ suffered it for you. Instead, he has a much different fate, a much different future, that of eternal life with him forever. Eternal paradise. Each of us have a call into ministry. None of us have Isaiah's call. Not a prophet. Some of us are called to leave behind jobs and vocations and go into a new one. I was. Most of you don't have that call. But you are called to share the faith that you've been given, a faith that was given you in baptism. That assurance, that word that, behold, your guilt is atoned for and your sin is forgiven, and it continues to be washed away to this very day. And as we go out, and as we're called to share that message with whoever God puts in our path, Know this, you're going to fail. I fail. It's a hard thing. 
There's times when God has a divine appointment for me and I fail to meet it. But these words come to me. Behold, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Pastor Mark, you're forgiven. And that's the message to you. And knowing that forgiveness is so real, that love so real and so wonderful, that moves my heart. It moves my heart to try again the next time there's a divine appointment. And I pray through that continual washing of your baptism, through that message of your guilt is atoned for and your sin is forgiven, you're enabled to take a stab at it when God presents a divine appointment to you so you can Give them that wonderful message of the gospel that you hold fast to. Amen. We've been given a wonderful faith and we can give words to it through the Nicene Creed. I would invite you to stand at this time and join me in doing so. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I will look the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Those of you who are members of Lamb of God, we ask you simply to fulfill part of that membership, which is giving your tithes and offerings, and you can do so in the box out in the narthex, bringing it in and placing it in the box across from the office during the week. You can mail it in or use our online giving portal. And that's one of the reasons it's so visitors here don't have to do that. That's beholden to us, not them. Our offering verse for today comes from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Let us sing to the glory and wonder of God.
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord God of hosts, build up your church and manifest your spirit among us with wisdom and knowledge. Let our words be measured and intelligible to our fellow Christians and to those outside your church, that we may utter our amens in Christ, Lord, your, in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Sustain those called to be fishers of men in Christ's church, that they would not be discouraged when they toil all night and take in nothing, but continue to let down their nets at his word according to that calling. Lord, in your mercy, grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may be mature in our thinking and infants in evil. Lord, in your mercy, give us faith to let down the nets of your word in our daily vocations and trust your Son to do his gracious work through poor sinners like us. Lord, in your mercy, O oh God, be not far from us. As you have worked deeds of salvation in Christ Jesus, so make haste to help us now in every trouble. Give healing to the sick, strength to the weak, and comfort to the afflicted, especially those that are upon our prayer list and these for whom special prayers have been requested. O oh Lord, be with Virginia Tim, who is recovering from a fall, that she would co receive complete, complete and quick recovery. Lord, in your mercy, for Jackie Glenn, who is recovering from surgery for, for uh, an issue with her hip sustained from a fall, that you would be with her, that you would send people to keep her calm, and you would heal her completely. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up to you the family of Carol Schubring, Jock, Larry Schubring's sister, who passed away this last week. May they know the comfort and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with Ron Jonas, who is suffering from congestion and breathing problems. As he awaits the result of his checks x-ray, Lord, we ask that it would be something not serious, that it would be something curable, that you were already working on healing him and restoring him to health. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, be with Bill Carpenter and his daughter as they suffer in Florida from COVID. Give them both complete restoration of health. Strengthen Mary Ann so she can take care of Bill. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Be with all families that are suffering from a variety of things and pressures that are going on in this world. From COVID and financial to other relational issues. Lord, be the strength of faith and love in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, we ask that you would be with Vicki, Glenda's sister, as she is transitioning into the world beyond. Keep her steadfast in her faith. Be with Glenda as she prepares to mourn the passing of her sister. May this be a time of trust and faith in the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with our brother Dale Lorrington as he is under the weather and having problems. We pray that his test results on Monday would be good and you would continue to work to heal him in his life. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Do not forsake us, nor for the generations to come, but be with us, O Lord, and heal and help us body and soul and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, be with all who are suffering from COVID. Be with those who must quarantine for their own health and the health of their loved ones. Keep them united as members of your body, the church, through your indwelling spirit. And we beg you, Lord, please remove this pandemic from our midst. Grant us the strength of faith and patience while we wait for your working in your time. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O oh, Lord, be with all among us who celebrate birthdays this week, including Jeannie Elliott, Steve Fakalak, Ida Conkey Stocker, Patricia Webb, and Susan Marchand. Grant them continued life with you now and eternal life to come. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O Lord, never depart from us. Though we are unworthy of you and your bounty, you are pleased to receive our meager thanks and reluctant obedience for the sake of Christ's perfect obedience. Let your word rule us and your spirit revive us to leave behind pride and anxiety alike, that we may follow you in all that we do. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, 
our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I would invite you to stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed of the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and his blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless, boundless love which he manifested to us when, pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and the wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O oh Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at his command and with his own words, we receive his testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Depart now with his joy and his peace, knowing all of your sins have been forgiven. May this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you body and soul to life everlasting and part in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but to always rule our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Church, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.